Hey. Oh, God. Oh, fuck. God, not doing that again. <laughs> Welcome to the Mo Show. I'm Massimo, I'm your host. You can call me Mo. So, good news, I sold my left kidney and now we have the budget for an inch. all about that vaporwave aesthetic. Here's a scenario. You're Asian. Your grandparents want you to be either a lawyer or a doctor, but joke's on them. You're an artist. Now, you have to defend your pride as an artist against their pride as Koreans. How do you do that? By passive aggressively painting them and then posting a video about it on YouTube. So today, I'm gonna teach you how to paint the portrait. Let's go over a few things before we jump in. These are my brushes. I've got one larger flat, one smaller flat, and one very small round. I try to keep my brushes to a minimum. There's not really a reason, I'm just weird. <laughs> Here's the reference I'll be using. That's my grandpa. Say hi, grandpa. Hello, grandson. I'm so proud of you and your career choices. Aw, oh, thanks, grandpa. This is my palette. It looks like a lot, but it's actually a pretty limited palette. If you watched my last video, I added a color from last time, and that is alizarin permanent. What I've got is titanium white, cadmium yellow light, cadmium red, alizarin permanent, burnt sienna, and ivory black. I think this is a great palette, honestly. If you want something that's really versatile, it's got a bunch of super strong colors. This palette will also be in the description if you'd like it. Now I start every painting with a basic lane, but for portraiture, it's kind of more involved. So I use a reference called the Lumen's Head method. San Prokopenko actually has a really great video on this. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail, but basically it's imagining the head as a sphere with the sides cut off uh, and the brow, nose, and mouth are placed uh, relative to the orientation of the sphere in space. Uh, it sounds complicated but it really makes it easier to understand the head and how it moves and just the uh, proportions and everything so if you're learning about the shape of the head I would totally recommend checking out the video which I'll link in the description below so first I like to do a general lay-in as you know with burnt sienna and ivory black I find this combination of colors to sit really well underneath uh, the skin tone then I like to block in the local colors of the painting with very broad strokes using my larger flat I like keeping it very general I know that some people when they do ala prima painting they use a small round right off the bat and then you just render everything completely as they move through the entire painting like bit by bit it's fine you can do that if you want I like to keep things very general for me, it would just seem natural moving into that as my eye developed. So I get a good sense of my range of values so they aren't compressed later on in the painting. I generally like to stay as general as I can throughout the painting. I don't like to focus on one thing a lot. I don't like thoroughly rendering a part and then realizing later I have to move it a tiny bit and then after having to redo all that, it's just kind of discouraging. Painting is definitely a game of patience. It's really easy to get aggravated or to just kind of think it sucks and want to start over. If you're painting and you start feeling that way, just take a break eat some ice cream, I don't know, <laughs> come back to it uh, and just try to finish it. I think finishing something is the best thing you can do for your art. It's one of the hardest things, definitely. I know that some of my paintings, this one here has been with me for a couple of months. It can be really hard to let something be done and kind of say, okay, this is the final product. This is the extent of what I can do right now. It doesn't mean it's your potential or anything, like if you really wanted something to be at your full potential, you'd never finish it because you're constantly getting better, right? So it's really just a snapshot of what you're doing now. When I'm doing the general lay-in, I also like to keep things very saturated because uh, as you get more detailed and you start putting in highlights and stuff, generally you start moving towards grayer colors and just having a lot of saturation underneath that layer kind of gives it a bit more vitality when you're doing portraiture. Uh, but that really is a wet on wet specific thing. If you're doing something like glazing, you might have a different story there. After I'm done doing a general lay-in with my bigger flat, I like to move towards my smaller flat. And this is my bread and butter, my toast and margarine, my Nutella and waffles. <laughs> I do most of my painting with this. It's just a very versatile brush. You can get very detailed by using the edge of it. Uh, and you can get some very nice strokes by just using the flat end. I don't know, I just, first off, I love flats and this size flat is just, I've learned to be my favorite. If you wanna know the specific size, it's A2 and the brand is, the initials are HJ. Everything's like, you can't see anything on this because I've used it so much. I'll find it someday. The rest of this painting will mostly be done in this. I say the brush I use the least is probably this small round. It's just for the very end, the very small details. So as I'm laying in smaller tiles of color, I'm not doing things very differently from the general in that I did to begin with. I'm just using smaller tiles of color now to describe the form more accurately and render it more. This stage of the painting kind of takes the longest. I'd say there's generally four stages of painting for me. 
uh, when I'm doing a la prima like this. There is the lay-in, like the drawing with my small round brush. There's the general lay-in with my bigger brush with the local colors. There's the rendering with my smaller flat, uh, which is the majority of the painting. And then finally, there is the detail work, which is like small highlights and stuff like that with my tiny round brush. Since this is an older person, there's a lot of texture in the skin. Uh, you notice there's a lot of creases, the pores might be larger. It can be kind of intimidating when you're going to paint an older person uh, because you're like, wow, there's so much texture. How am I gonna capture that? They're just gonna look baby faced when I paint them. And for that, we're gonna be doing some impasto painting with some thicker paint using this medium. This is impasto medium, Rublev impasto medium, which thickens up your paint without diluting the color or anything. It's great for impasto work. You'll notice in very bright areas, I'll be using this impasto medium because generally the forms that catch the most light will describe texture a lot more if you look at the reference or something like that. So impasto medium is great for that because it would take a lot of refining with a lot of smaller brushes if you were to do this more indirectly, like with glazing or something like that, uh, which is why I love impasto medium. It's very uh, representational and it makes it a lot of fun too, honestly. This stage can be the stage where a lot of people give up. Um, I would really try and push through this. It's just hard because you're like, wow, you always look at the painting and, you, and you're and you just like, there's always more work. It's just like, oh, there's another thing I have to do or there's more stuff, right? Um, but you'll get through it eventually. I'd say just keep sticking with it. And the more you finish paintings, the more it's gonna become natural to not feel that anymore. And it just becomes more and more fun. So try not to give up here. Now, after we've done the rendering, we've described all the forms and stuff like that. We're going in with the small round and laying in the fine details. This part can be like some people's favorite part. I'm not a huge fan of it. I like keeping things very general. I love representational stuff like Rembrandt and Sargent. The realism work is some of my favorite, but you see that I'm using this for like the eyes, the eyelids specifically is a part that the eyes draw a lot of attention to the painting, so you wanna make sure those are kind of more rendered than some of the other parts. I use it a bit in the hair, a bit in the chin as well. There's some smaller highlights that you're not gonna see that well. Basically you wanna use detail as a method of drawing your viewer's attention. If it's not an important part of the painting, say it's like the, the lower jaw and the, on the dark side where it's mostly one value, you don't want to put a lot of detail there. You don't, you don't want to spend a lot of time there and it's not just for efficiency's sake. If something's detailed, it's going to draw the viewer's eye. If you, if you do the entire painting and it's all very highly rendered and everything's very small, unless you have a very good sense of value, your whole painting will be fighting for attention and it's going to confuse the viewer it's gonna be very overwhelming to look at. So try to use detail to your advantage. Use it as a method of drawing the viewer's eye. So places that you want to garner attention, use detail there. So the eyes, I put a lot in the forehead, the nose, these very important areas for expression or things that are vital to portraiture, that's where I keep the detail. And finally, my signature, and that's it. That's the whole painting. We have a finished portrait study. If I wanted, I could now take this and do a bigger piece based on the smaller study that I did, taking what I learned and translating it to a bigger canvas in more detail. I hope you guys like the painting. In all seriousness, if you are someone who's had your creative aspirations kind of trampled on by an individual or even by society or something like that, I wouldn't let it get to you. Creatives have a very tough time being acknowledged. That's just the nature of being a creative. People will always criticize the results of your effort or even the effort itself. And it's only when you can kind of offer them something that then they'll start paying attention to you or when they realize that you're kind of making it. But it shouldn't matter really. If you love something, do it because you love it, not because people say you're good at it or you get recognized for it or you get money from it. It doesn't have to sustain you financially or it doesn't have to be good in other people's eyes to be good art to you. Honestly, just have fun with it. I think the most wholesome art is art done by people who are amateurs, not looking to make a buck or live off of it or make art history. I think that really embodies art. No, I, I'm not taking my own advice. I'm definitely trying to be an artist, but it shouldn't matter. If you love something, you should do it because you love it, not because other people love it or they will pay you money for it or they tell you you're really good or for recognition or what have you. In the end, anyways, it'll all come to bear. The only thing that will sustain you is your love of doing it. So I hope the negativity in the world doesn't ever dissuade you from doing art, painting or drawing or writing or anything creative. It's a blast. It's what I live for, honestly. If you like this video, 
please give it a thumbs up. If this got you painting at all, if this maybe taught you something, definitely leave a comment or shoot me a message. I would love to hear about it. And please subscribe if you haven't already. I'll be posting a lot more videos about art. So keep painting and I'll see you next week. Bye.